Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. New York is a present tense city. It lives in the moment, perhaps because the city's full blast immediacy engages all the senses simultaneously, squeezing the faculties that allow for reflection on the past and speculation about the future. Like riders on a roller coaster, New Yorkers simply hold on tight. So says William Grimes, former restaurant critic for the New York Times, in his new book, Appetite City, A Culinary History of New York. A delectable taste of New York City restaurants, dining styles, and dishes over the last two century, and a gustatory tour of the social, cultural, and geographic history of New York. William Grimes was restaurant critic for the New York Times from 1999 to 2004. He then wrote book reviews for the paper before becoming a writer of obituaries in 2008. He is the author of Straight Up or on the Rocks, My Feathered Friend, Eating Your Words, and co-author of the New York Times Guide to Restaurants, 2004. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Uh, great read. Great visuals. There are so many uh, lithographs, photographs, menus. What was it like researching it? Well, you know, a lot of those menus came straight from the New York Public Library. They have a massive collection that dates back to the middle of the 19th century, tens of thousands of menus. And uh, I had put together an exhibition at the library a few years back uh, called New York Eats Out. And the menus were at the center of that. And as I delved into this collection, I began getting the idea for this book. I, I understand that Paul Leclerc was somewhat influential in pushing you along in this way. Yeah, he, he really he started the ball rolling by giving me a phone call when I was restaurant critic saying, look, we've got this collection that you know about because you've written about it in the Times before. How would you like to get, you know, get your, your hands in there even deeper and, and play around with the collection and do an exhibition? I said, yeah, this is a great excuse. You salivate. A great excuse for me to do something I wanted to do. Excellent. Uh, you, you argue in the book that New York City today and in the recent past is the food capital of the world. And in, in the book, you note that Paris has the best French restaurants, Madrid has the best Spanish restaurants, but New York City has the best cuisine in the world. It's more international, it's more, more diverse, and we've got those restaurants and others. That's right. I mean, if you want, we have more of everything. We have the, the United Nations of food in New York, and it's been that way for a very long time. So, uh, you know, the, the specific, if you want the finest Japanese restaurant in the world, you're probably going to go to Kyoto or Tokyo. Mm -hmm. But if you're in Paris and you're looking for a Japanese restaurant, or a Spanish restaurant or a Mexican restaurant, you may be badly out of luck. In New York, you're in good shape. So this is, this is gustatory heaven. This is, is Nirvana. This is Nirvana. But we've, we've not always been Nirvana. I mean, and one of the, the glories of the book is that you've got, uh, you take us through mm -hmm. basically two centuries, from the turn of mm -hmm. the 18th to the 19th century till 2008, so we're talking a long time. I start in the 1820s, the early 1820s, when New York is just getting ready to take that big springboard leap into becoming an international powerhouse city mm -hmm. of finance and trade. And the Erie Canal right. is the convenient linchpin for all of this. Well, what do we know? We know that there were three brothers from Switzerland named Delmonico who decided to set up shop, a modest little cafe, at just this time. Talk about good timing. Timing, 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 location, location, location. Right. These, these guys had a, opened a cafe that was kind of modest, but it had a French flair, and it bought something new and distinctive to a city that badly needed okay, it. Okay, it badly needed it. Describe New York City pre 
Delmonico brothers. Well, and also during them as well. Well, you had, you know, it's not like you could not get a, something to eat. You could, of course. There were taverns. There were boarding houses where you were fed. There were a handful of hotels that fed you on what was called the American plan. That is a set time for the meal and a set uh, menu. You didn't order specifically what you wanted, you just reached for it. It was kind of glorified boarding house. There were uh, places that served what they called shilling plates, which is really kind of meat and two veg, and they threw it at you. But if you think of a restaurant as a place where you can eat when you want to eat there, you order from a menu and a server serves you, there was there that oh, did the not exist. Of a restaurant that yes. didn't exist. That didn't exist. The and, Delmonico's created. And it. you really describe the that that era as as a basically a vast gustatory wasteland. Uh, it was pretty sad, and most people ate at home. That's true. And, and, and was there a class difference? One of the th interesting things about the book is how you relate the dem demography, the socioeconomics, mm -hmm. the geography all together. It, it, is it a class thing? Do the wealthy people eat out and the workers eat at home? Well, here's the thing about New York. Very early on, in most places, people went home to eat lunch, for example, because they... Uh, home was very near to where they worked. Mm. In New York, very early on, that distance became too great to travel. And so you had an enormous market for feeding a huge number of people at lunchtime in lower Manhattan because they couldn't go home sure. to get food. Rich people were very slow to catch on to, particularly if they were of Dutch descent, very conservative. They ate at home. The idea of eating at a restaurant was just peculiar. It was a strange thing. These poor Frenchmen who set up pastry shops and, uh, in the 1820s and 30s, uh, they just watched these Knickerbocker fashionable people walk by their windows and peer in curiously, but they would never dream of stepping in. Who ate them? Who so, ate their products? Well, they had a lot of um, people coming in from the hinterlands, uh, homegrown sophisticates like this fellow Sam Ward that I start the book with. Character. He became a yes. He later became a big uh, political fixer and a scandal monger, and uh, but he had a refined palate and no place to exercise it. That's why he was so excited when Delmonico's came along. He and his friends from Columbia College would go there. So they. And, and college hangout. College hangout for like adventurous uh, people who wanted a, a whiff of, of Europe in New York. And in a sense, Delmonico's moves, it, it, its real estate moves, as well as the, you know the the changes in the cuisine, really tracks New York City's history for a long period of time. Yeah, you just follow the bouncing ball, Delmonico's, and they move at. At, at shrewdly calculated intervals, they obviously read the real estate map and they knew their clientele who were the, the well-to-do of New York. One of the things that you constantly point out is that exactly that, they, they were real estate seers, if you will, mm -hmm. and they saw what was coming or by moving they brought what was coming with them. Talk about the role of their movement in, in changing the city. Well, they started out as everything started out at the tip, tip, tip of Manhattan. They started out on Williams Street. Uh, they gradually, uh, they became rather a lavish restaurant early on uh, within, say, 10 years of opening in the 1820s. They made the leap to 14th Street in about 1860. Uh, they made a further leap to Madison Square in 1876. And they made their final leap to 44th and 5th in about 1898, I believe. And so, the city is moving both with the, following them and moving with them. So you've got Union Square, Madison Square mm -hmm. being centers of theater, nightlife, of, and a variety mm -hmm. of entertainments and commercial activity. Absolutely. I mean, there was a synergy between, particularly between theaters and restaurants. Theaters often cl had clustered around them almost like barnacles. Uh, there would be an oyster cellar, there would be a chop house. Sometimes the chop houses were run by members of the stock companies, so they were act, they became actor hangouts. But the, the um, People forget in, in the present age of entertainment on all fronts that the theater was so such an enormous draw. The foot traffic around a theater was huge, and that uh, provided custom for anybody opening a restaurant. Was that new, unique to New York, the, the, the marriage of the dining and the entertainment, or if not unique to it, it's most... I think it was a vibrant this, example. Of it, it was the most vibrant example, simply because there were more people in New York, there were more theaters, and it was um, a much more intensified, concentrated version of what was true in other cities. Okay, now 
you then talk about the stages uh, of how this this begins to develop. What's if is there a golden age of restaurants or golden ages, and how are they similar and different from one another? Well, I think. You know, there was a big, long golden age, which you could subdivide, but beginning in, say, the late, um, say, about 1880 to Prohibition okay. was a great age in New York. In what way? And it was great because you had um, all the right influences working for you. You had enormous wealth pouring in after the Civil War, and that kept, uh, that supported these very high-end, ritzy restaurants. You had immigration floods and floods, waves of waves of immigration that was supporting very inexpensive, low-end uh, restaurants, Italian, French, Italian, th that uh, would provide meals of like 50-cent, six-course dinner oh, down in the village. Oh, unbelievable. The menus are, are incredible. Uh -huh. the, uh, at the same, and at the very lowest end, you had uh, clever people thinking up uh, new ideas for feeding large numbers at low price. They were actually penny restaurants. The, uh, there was no income tax. You know, there was the money was flowing through New York. New York was booming, prosperous. Uh, it was flexing its muscles in every way. So you have these entertainment districts um, popping up first on Madison Square, say in the 1870s. Well, then, the, the original Madison Square Garden, it's right? Madison White. Square Garden was there, and around the park, which was beautifully landscaped, there were luxury hotels, and every one of those hotels had a great restaurant. Mm. Delmonico's was there, and then when you get toward the turn of the century, you have this new place we call Times Square after 1904. More than 20 theaters popping up in a period of maybe 15 years. And uh, these restaurants they call lobster palaces that were kind of flashy Vegas style restaurants. Yeah, go ahead. Talk about talk about the the lobster palaces and talk about the the oyster court. Start with the lobster palaces. Well, the lo they called them that because you would you would get champagne and lobster. They were the they were the kind of restaurants you went to, particularly if you were an out of towner and you wanted to show off and had to pick up a chorus girl from one of the reviews. Nice. You'd want to go into one of the lobster palaces and uh, spend freely. This was for the kind of the louder, the nouveau riche, the louder, more display-oriented customer, whereas Delmonico's and its great rival Sherry's, the, those were for what they called the, the 400, the creme de la creme okay, of so New York society. Okay, so we have a, a socioeconomic, certainly, and class division here. Yes, we do. And uh, it's not that there was, you know, some people who ate at Delmonico's and Sherry's would also eat oh, in a sure, lobster palace. Sure, sure. You know, people, but, but they're slumming. They're slumming. They're, they're, they're cutting loose when they're going to the lobster hey, palace. Come on. And these were uh, very large uh, restaurants. And they, you know, they, they, as some of these Vegas restaurants try to do, they go for the best chefs and they're really trying to do something, um, you know, uh, they're trying to do a good job on the cuisine. They, they were fabulous kind of restaurants with a sense of theater to them in the theater district. Okay. And the most extreme example being Murray's Roman Gardens. Please. The first steam restaurant in New York. It was opened in 1908, and this crazy architect came up with this interior scheme that combined not just Roman but Egyptian and, and uh, Assyrian. And upstairs there was something called the Dragon Room, which had a replica of the, the Imperial Gardens in Peking, and there was a, an electric railroad that ran around these Imperial Gardens that delivered food to each plate as it, uh, as it went around the tour there. So it was just a crazy fantasy. It was somebody was smoking something strange when they put that restaurant Or out. ingesting or injecting something. Uh -huh. Yeah. There was a, a more things changed, the more they re remain the same quality to some of this, but then there's some mm -hmm. of the things where things change. What would a, a traveler from an earlier period in New York City's, you know, culinary history land today uh, here at the studio, 34th and 5th, mm -hmm. and walk in a, in a radius, 20 blocks north, 20 blocks south, river to river? Mm -hmm. Well, what would they know? They'd probably, they wouldn't see the street foods that they knew and loved back in the old days. Uh, there would be, they wouldn't be able to buy oysters on the half shell from a street And bar. oysters, excuse me, were a major part of the, talk about the oysters, just well, a little I mean, digression. It's, it's almost the defining food of New York for a century, that the, the, uh, the natural habitat here was ideal for oysters, and there were just the abundance of the oyster before, you know, industry and, and, and waste and pollution 
sort of drove the oyster, depleted the and natural consumption right. uh, in as food, depleted the oyster beds and they retreated farther and farther up Long Island. But for a while, there were just dozens and dozens of, of names of oysters that have disappeared into the, to the mists of history, the Shrewsburys, the Saddle Rocks, the Rockaways. Now, we have Blue Points still, but there used to be, you would have two dozen or three dozen names that you could choose from. I know. I mean, and, and it shows in, in, in the menus. But they're selling these oysters on carts in the 18, you know, mid-1800s. I mean, how many people died of... Well, I, 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 mean, it, it, I thought about that. Yeah, you, man. Had to, you had to be brave to step up to the cart. But it wasn't just a little... The carts where they were sold for, you know, the oysters were just maybe a penny a piece. But you'd go to the great markets of the city that were cities within the city, the Fulton Market and the talk, Washington Market. Yeah, please. And then the fly... Talk about the markets, because one of the things that struck me was the huge number of food specimens that they had in these markets was astounding. Talk That's the other that. thing that this time traveler would notice. They would want to go to the... F look. They would look for the Fulton Market, uh, because you could get everything there in the Walmart of its day. It wasn't just food. It was you could buy a shoelace or you could buy a used novel. Or, but primarily it was a food market. And there were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stalls where it would be produce, game, meat, fish, oysters. Uh, the rivers would just be gridlocked. The night before, the, mark, the farmers would come from lower New, New York counties and New Jersey on the one side and from Long Island and Queen, what's now Queens on the other side, and they would just assemble like mighty armies raiding to cross the river. And at dawn, they would come across to unload, creating this ungodly crush around the markets, which were chaotic and dirty and messy, but great food sources for every restaurant in the city, the boarding houses, and for people shop, shopping at home. Um, there were there were game birds that just populated the meadowlands of dozens, New Jersey. Dozens, dozens. Uh, plover, snipe, woodcock. You don't see those on menus. No, you don't even know what they are. You don't even know what they are, but they were in abundance. You know, you if, had game on 86th Street for you know. If if they were available now, you in 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 sufficient quantities, you could just open a restaurant and make. You could be the next fad. Oh yeah, I, if you could. Uh, if you bring that back, I mean, you see that there is has lately been a vogue for this sort of uh, the off cuts of meat, you know, the right. the entrails and the the hooves and the and all that sort, sort of thing. Sort of old time, lower socioeconomic class eating where you had to eat it, but mm -hmm. now it's. Yeah, beef cheeks, you know, uh, you talk to uh, right. uh, older Italians and say, well, yeah, we used to stuff ravioli with that. That was like a cheap cut of meat. Right. And those that they, you can't get any more uh, slick than beef cheeks these days. <laughs> One of the things that I would notice would be, I think, the, the, the street courts. That was what was astounding. I, I'm a big street food eater. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, you know, a couple of your colleagues at the Times have taken me to some of the street food around there. You, you had a lot of street food. You had tamale sellers. You had the corn girls. You had mm -hmm. the, uh, lots of lots of that. Lots of strolling vendors uh, at the markets. There would be strolling. Walt Whitman, one of his journalistic pieces, was on a guy, a guy with a kind of big canister of coffee and a coffee and cake seller. This guy was this particular guy was selling crullers and a, a little tripod with a stand on it that had a little coal fire, and that's where he doled out the hot coffee and sell donuts. Uh, there would be pie strolling pie vendors. Some carts would be stationary. Some of these carts morphed into actual cafes and restaurants. Wow. Some of the best restaurants in the city came from these oyster wholesalers who decided, well, if I set up, put a board across two barrels, I can sell oyster by the half shell. And if I get a little stove, I can make oyster stews. One thing led to another. And suddenly you had a great restaurant like A.P. Dorland's, wow. one of the most famous in the city. And people would sweep through these markets late at night on the way back across the river to either side after the theater, and they would, uh, they would be the clientele for a lot of these restaurants. One thing that was interesting, just to go back to the, the oyster stands, was the role of black entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in that particular business. And that yes. seemed to be the, their prime entree yes. into, into that realm. Many of the oyster dealers and, um, and early uh, some of the famous restaurants were started by black entrepreneurs who, this was an entry point, uh, what Hollywood was for Jews. 
uh, oyster the business was for blacks in New York. Where did they go subsequently? Did they stay within the food industry or did they move elsewhere or did they stay there? They, uh, the ones we know about stayed there, uh, accumulated a nice amount of money and retired with, in comfort and became distinguished members of the community, active in their church, active in civil rights nice. and, uh, uh, and, and even got obituaries in the New York Times. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Then you move to the, 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 the larger issue, as, as you describe it here, of women and culinary New York. And in a sense, there's almost a, a gender history here mm -hmm. and a history of real sex discrimination. Sure. In fact, talk about that. Well, that was one of the more um, elusive topics because it was very hard to get a read on if you were a woman in 1840, where could you eat and where could you not eat? Uh, on the one hand, it was fairly segregated by sex. There's no question about that. And when there were some uh, restaurants uh, in what is now Tribeca called the ice cream parlors is what they were called. Mm -hmm. They served, they're a little more glorified than ice cream parlors. They were quite palatial. But one of their distinguishing characteristics was women could go there and get a meal. And that was a big, um, uh, this was a big step forward for women to be able to go unescorted and uh, with their female friends after shopping, for example, to go to these places and eat. In other restaurants, they would either be turned away or directed to a uh, lady's entrance and a separate cafe. Some restaurants, but I would run across accounts of foreign visitors kind of being surprised at seeing women eating at certain New York restaurants unaccompanied by men and, mm. and noting that, um, that nobody around seemed to notice and think that this was remarkable. Now, so it's very hard. To, it, I, th I suspect it changed according to the type of restaurant, the management, and uh, the neighborhood. I sure. think if you're farther downtown, sure. I think things were a little looser. The right. more formal the restaurant, the more strictly the segregation. Certainly it worked that way with smoking. You know, the, finally, it was th this was like a big news story around, with, as New Year's Eve approached around the year 1904 or 5, there was uh, a big push on to it was a, a very fancy French restaurant called Café Martin, and it was the coolest French restaurant in town. It had banquettes, and it had Art Nouveau decoration. And the uh, owner decided women can smoke. This New Year's Eve, we're going to do it. Women can smoke. Well, it was um, women had been sneaking cigarettes. For their, their dining partner would pass them a cigarette, and they'd pretend to be just taking a puff off his, but they would kind of hang on to the cigarette, or they'd hide it with a fan. You know, there was cheating going on. They were trying to legalize the cheating. Right. Uh, it didn't work, but gradually the city council rebelled and uh, tried to pass ordinances that took back the gain. But within a few years, it was all over. Everybody was smoking, women included. Okay, let's go back sort of to the, the chronological the pro prohibition and depression, there were exceptions, but generally we're back to wasteland. It was the most catastrophic event. It was the uh, it was the nine eleven for for food history. This is prohibition. This is prohibition. Prohibition slammed the door shut on a century of progress in New York dining, because it put out of business all those lobster palaces. They all got many of them were taken over by uh, Chinese restaurateurs who where used them, these huge dining mm -hmm. facilities to put on. They did dancing, and they did uh, very inexpensive meals, and secretaries could afford to eat there. But it was, the tone was totally different, obviously, from the lobster palaces. Nobody could really, some of the hotels could make up by charging higher room, mates and, uh, room rates and keep the restaurant going. But without alcohol sales, restaurants really can't make a go when, of it. When does the Renaissance begin? I think the Renaissance really doesn't begin. I I, um, I pick the World's Fair of '39 mm -hmm. as the return of something like excitement and life to New York dining because of all the international restaurants that were in all the pavilions that came from from countries, from the international uh, exhibitors. And you don't think of the 39 World's Fair. You think of it as a technology fair. Right. Shows right. Like early oh, television. Sure. You don't think of it as a dining. Event, but for me it was a dining event because all these restaurants came and and many of them stayed uh, after the after the fair closed and became great restaurants in New York and brought back uh, got the juices flowing again. But it wasn't until after the war really that uh, New York started picking up a little steam once again, 
And it, you know, once you do damage like Prohibition did in the long years of depression, uh, it takes a long time to recover from Yeah, that. I mean, in Those the 50s and 60s, really, in, in, in a sense, were, you know, periods that one could forget uh -huh. or, or they are forgotten. Yeah. If you could go back in any food time in New York, when would you go back? Uh, that's, I asked myself that question many times in uh, researching this book. I thought if I had one chance, where would I go? Sure. And I, I, you know, I'd be tempted. The Lobster Palace scene I'm intensely curious about. But at the low end, around Park, Park Row, across from City Hall, that's where the publishing industry was. Right. All the newspapers yep. were there and all the little support industries. You know, that's where the sketch artists would go and the engravers would be there and the printers. And this. It was a 24-hour scene. And there were very um, inexpensive restaurants that served this heaving mass of newsboys and cub reporters and... Uh, and all the way up to the publishers themselves. And I would lo love to have seen that scene. Because oh, quickly, restaurant that you would go back to. I would. That you, were, you, you, you didn't eat at. You haven't eaten at. An historical restaurant. One. Uh, Murray's Roman Gardens, just to see it. Just to, put, to feast my eyes on what, what had to have been the craziest restaurant that ever came to the city. Okay, thank you. My thanks to William Grimes, author of Appetite City, A Culinary History of New York, for being on the show. We're going to continue this conversation next week, so please tune in. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.